Food is not just weight. Food is energy. Food is mood. Food is sex drive. Food mm -hmm. is your patience. It's your attitude. It's everything. You need to just break the link if it's just tied to weight. At Arta, we just want to help people to create optimal health so that they can live in their best life now and always. It stems from what happened to me as a child and the fact that I was so unwell and just through food, I, I transformed my life. Food and targeted supplements and learning about how my, my body works. If you're somebody who always has headaches and problems with their sinuses, you don't notice if you're headachy and sinusy the following day. If you're feeling great, you notice it. You need to reframe, this food makes me feel bad. And that's very different than saying, I can't have it because I'm heavy. When I was eating very well, yeah. I would notice bloating straight away. Yes. And I was like, I feel so uncomfortable. This yeah, because so your terrible. normal is not bloated at all. But when I'm permanently bloated, you don't notice it. I don't notice it. Yeah. But worse than that, I eat foods that compound it. We get stuck in ways like, oh, I used to be able to eat like this. You're like, well, I also used to get 10 hours of sleep a night. You know, things, <laughs> things change. How can you be healthy without it feeling like a chore? At some point, you just need to decide, right? What's more important? The the cookie or the bloating. Our health is something we're very on off with, right? But what if at the start of your year, you said, okay, every quarter. Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work, and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. So, Rianne, Thank you so much for coming on the show. Pleasure to meet you in person. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great. Yeah. I'm excited. So you're a nutritionist. Yes. Naturopath. You were the former CEO of Cycle. Yes. Which must be, I think every single Londoner must know of Cycle, have been to it at some point in, in their lives. I hope so. I think so. I yeah. think so as well. Yeah. I just, I, personally, I don't know anyone who hasn't been there. Good. <laughs> and, um, and recently also have started Arta. Yes which is a science-led supplement. Mm -hmm. So clearly physical health, exercising is very important to you. Why is that? So when I was a child, I was very unwell. Um, probably from the, about the age of five, I was always sick. So whether it was sinus infections or strep throat or, or bronchitis, I was sick, you know, multiple times a year, probably on antibiotics every other month. And I always noticed that none of the other kids were. So I was just, you know, really tired. We, we could never figure out what was wrong. Um, it just got worse as I got older. Um, and we went through tons of doctors and nobody could find what was wrong. So they all said that I was fine, even though we knew that I was not fine. So probably by the age of 15, we just thought that I'm just a sickly kid. Like that was just my disposition. Um, thankfully my mom was like, no, I, I just don't think that's right. And finally, probably when I was, I, th I think I was about 17, she took me to see a functional medicine doctor. Um, and they found out that I have an allergy to whey and to casein, which are the proteins in milk. Mm. So just from changing my diet, my whole world transformed. I went from waking up feeling terrible to waking up with energy. I went from being sick probably every other month to not being sick for years and years and years. So I don't take for granted what health is. And I think until you've been ill or until you haven't felt healthy, we just kind of expect our bodies and minds to be able to do whatever we want. And actually we're so lucky to be healthy. Um, and so that is 
you know, something that really guides me. I really want to help people to mm. be as healthy and as energetic as possible for as long as possible. You're so right about when yeah. you haven't felt good in your body. Yeah. And then all of a sudden finding out something about it and all of a sudden- it I was shocked. Life changes. It, it changed my whole life because like, like, I mean, my symptoms were across almost every system. So I had migraines. Um, I had to sleep upright because I, I had heartburn. This is age 10, 12, right? So all of a sudden not having those things, I was like, this is amazing. And it was just from changing what, what I ate. So I didn't change how I trained. I didn't change anything else. And I literally was a different person. So mm -hmm. it really inspired me. And, um, that's kind of what got me into to the field that I'm in now sport wise. I just have always loved sports. So I used to swim, um, but sport health is all a part of the same thing, right? Mm. It must be amazing to also have a parent who didn't let go of mm. the fact that you were complaining and actually trying to understand what the actual issue is. Well, my mother suffered from candida. Um, and back then candida was one of those things that they laughed off being like, it's, it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. So she was also very ill for a lot of years. Um, when she was younger, she had bad acne. So they put her on antibiotics for years, you know, years and years and years. So that as we know now would have obviously killed her, 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 her microbiome. So she then suffered from chronic candida and went to, to the doctor kind of relentlessly and nothing helped. Um, and it really impacted her life, um, and her marriage. Mm -hmm. So she then bought this book. I don't know the name of it, but, but, but it was by a naturopath and it was the candida cleanse. And that was kind of the first time people were starting to really look at those kind of more hardcore therapeutic things to, to, to help. And she went on this diet and after six months it was gone. Mm. And so I, I think that also showed her, okay, well, there will be an answer and it's not just um, what the doctors say in, in most, well, sorry, in, in our cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's incredible what you can do by just changing your diet. I mean, I yeah. didn't really realize that was the case for everyone. And even like, you know, you can live a perfectly okay lifestyle. Yeah. I was extremely stressed one day. Um, and that, when I say stress one day, yeah. obviously after just, years just and years over, and like, years. No, no, no. After, well, it was it was more, of a, but something has happened that was you yeah. know, quite traumatic in my life, and then I couldn't eat any longer. I was so stressed that I couldn't actually ingest anything. Yeah, and I was like, okay, well, this is an opportunity to start trialing what you can eat. Yes, and to see what effect that they might have on your body. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting period of time because I did realize that you know what you put inside your body makes a huge difference to how you feel. Yeah. And even though we know that the impact of it is, you know, for our benefit, we still don't. Yeah. We know now kind of from what we have to self teach ourselves. Right. Mm. But we're never taught this. So mm -hmm. I think that's the fundamental issue is that we never learn the importance of this, this stuff. And when you look at food, I mean, food is food becomes our cells. It becomes our neurotransmitters. It becomes our hormones. We use the building blocks from food to do everything. Um, so of course it makes complete sense when you put it that way, that that should affect how we feel. And yet it's, there's still just such a disconnect between what we eat and how we feel and how healthy we are. And so that's one of the things that has just got to change. Um, and thankfully it is starting to change now, but it, but it's tough, right? Because you've got the science, but then you've got food marketing and food companies who are kind of trying to sell you products. And so one day you think, you know, the keto bars out. So is the keto diet good or is this happening? And then there's the low carb bars, then there's the vegan stuff. And so we're bombarded with mixed messaging. So it's very challenging to understand actually what is healthy and what does that mean? So because of that, I think a lot of people just switch off. And that's, that's where I think, you know, mm. we fall short a bit. So on that point of education, how, yeah. how did you educate yourself after you have found out that, you know, you, you were allergic to these things? What happened since, what happened after that? Um, so the, the, the practitioner who I worked with kind of just helped me on the day to day, but then, um, I went to university and, and that's what, what I did. So I, I did my undergraduate in biomedical sciences, uh, and then I did a master's in nutrition and then I did my ND in naturopathic medicine. So, I mean, that's because it happened at such a young age and I always loved science. So I knew that I, I, I either wanted to be a physio or a chiro or a doctor or a nutritionist. Like I was always really into that. Um, after I was done university, um, and my, my ND, I actually came here. So I moved here right afterwards and I worked in clinic for 
just over eight years. Um, and I specialize in women's health and metabolic health and kind of weight management and energy. Um, and then I started consulting more freelance and that's when I met, um, the shareholders of cycle and they wanted me to just, uh, to consult on kind of what kind of nutrition should be in their first site. Um, and so I got involved and I, they very quickly saw that I had a lot to say about what I thought it could be like and what it, what would attract people to the brand. Um, and then thankfully they asked me to come on board full time and then they asked me to, to be CEO within a few months. So, mm. I mean, it, it was a very, very, um, quick and unplanned transition. Um, but it was a great opportunity and it blended kind of my love for fitness and health and stuff. And I think at that point too, I had a bit of fatigue from private practice because, um, back then it, it still felt like quite a battle to convince people that if they took care of their nutrition or took supplements that it, it would help. And people would come and kind of say, isn't nutrition kind of a fad? And I was like, no, no, it's a, it's a, it's a real it's a, thing. It's a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> Promise you. Yeah. So it, it was also quite nice to have, um, to be able to, to take that, but also then go into s something else. But now I'm glad I'm back as well. So mm. it's come full circle. Mm. Yeah. What was it like at Cycle? I mean, it was such a, a massive thing at the time. I mean, I was I remember waking up at the crack of dawn mm -hmm. and just like turning up and feeling just so inspired and so energized and yeah, just kind of curious from your perspective, what it was like running yeah. the business and yeah, I suppose starting a massive trend in that. Yeah. So uh, certainly when I, when I got involved, um, and was speaking to the board about kind of the vision, it's more that I wanted to create a place that, um, it, that's celebrated kind of the joy of movement, right? Because back then, I mean, this was eight years ago now, people were still talking about like, oh, I have to train because I ate badly or I have to train because I was bad. So it was more like a punishment. And people thought I was so odd because I because I was like, who wants to go to a spin class and then go out or who wants to go for a run? And they're like, why would you want to exercise for fun? <laughs> um, and they thought it was such a strange mm -hmm. thing. And back then, he, I mean, I think the Berries guys opened just before us, but there was no boutique fitness yet. So going to the gym was pretty depressing. Um, so I, I understand why people might think that, but coming from my personal experience, like being on the swim team was the best thing for me. I just loved it. I loved the camaraderie. I loved how powerful you could feel on a day where you had otherwise felt terrible. I loved how it could just change your state. I love how much confidence it gave you. So I really wanted to create that. And also I found it very challenging here because there wasn't a lot of social things that you could do that didn't involve alcohol. Um, and it's fine to drink, but it's just like, it, it was just a bit much. Right. So I wanted to really create kind of a, that kind of the, the fun around working out and to convince people that you don't just work out to punish yourself. yourself. Right. So we didn't want to talk about weight. We didn't want to talk about lose seven inches in seven days. We wanted to just talk about like, this is going to make you feel great. It's going to improve the quality of your life. It's going to improve the quality of your relationships. And it's like vital time you need to take for yourself. So, I mean, it was pretty wild because at first it was really hard because the press were like, and how many calories do you burn? And I was like, well, it doesn't matter. So I was always trying to sidestep the conversation about weight and inches, but that's still what people were interested in. So it was really hard to stay on message. And then after time, finally, when people started to really get hooked and then it started to be talked about more in the media, people got it. And then it was just like, it, it exploded and it, it was amazing. Mm. Yeah. Actually, on that note about weight. Yes. Part of the reason why many people exercise is just to lose weight. Yeah. And is that motivation enough? I don't know. I, I mean, for some people it can be. It depends if if it's working for them. I think weight can be quite a negatively motivating factor, right? Because you're starting off saying, I'm not good enough. I'll be happy when I'm, right? So I'll be happy when I'm 125 pounds or I'll be happy when I'm this. If it's a part of the reason why, I think, of course, it can be fine. And there's nothing wrong with working out to lose weight, but working out is so much more than that, right? So I think sometimes it gets 
entangled in if you're being good or if you're being bad. So if you're being good, you're exercising and you're eating incredibly well. And if you're being bad, you're doing nothing. And there's a middle ground, right? Life is never going to be like that. There's always the, the, the in between, and there's always going to be things that we want to do life, you know, our birthdays or celebrations. So we can't kind of have such a black and white approach. Um, and so I think that for most people, if they're exercising only for weight, it doesn't work well. Do you find that people don't stay on the path and they just fall off the wagon, so to speak, if it's the only motivation? Um, Again, I think it depends on their background. So if this is the first time they've exercised and they're exercising to lose weight and they feel quite negative about it, then I think it's it's usually quite a negative outcome. Mm -hmm. I think if they see, see exercise as a form of, of self-care and find a type that they enjoy, then it becomes this really positive um, momentum, right? Because there's no point in really trying to punish yourself with a workout that you don't enjoy when you're already unhappy about it a lot of things. I think that's a challenge and that won't give you the outcome that you want. I think if you are curious about your health and really looking at it as something you're going to do long-term and you find something that you love, because there's so many ways we can exercise. I guarantee you that everybody can find something that they love. Everybody can. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that that is, is kind of just the tweak you've got to make. So say you do want to lose weight. That's yes. your main motivation. What's the best way of going about doing that? Um, so first and foremost, you need to look at your diet, you know, Exercise is important, but nutrition is more important. Um, and you need to kind of, I always say it's important to, to, to kind of take stock, right? So make a food log, make a, an exercise log, make a stress log, kind of all the things that impact your life. Make a sleep log because again, sleep too is such an important factor. And then work out kind of how you feel and what kind of habits you see that are probably not helping you get to where you want to be. And then you need to set some goals, right? So I want to feel this and I want to achieve this. I think it's really important to set state goals and outcome goals. What that means is not just a weight. It's kind of like, I want to learn how to manage my anxiety, or I want to be able to switch off at night so I can spend time with my kids, or I want to go on an adventure and right. So it's not just about w whether or not you've hit that weight, right? Because if you're somebody, for example, who's having a really hard time with emotional eating and you say, well, in one month, I want to lose 10 pounds, right? So that's one goal at the end of that month. If you haven't lost your 10 pounds, most people s will switch off, mm -hmm. right? If you say, I want to lose 10 pounds, but also start to re reframe my relationship with food. And I want to not binge, you know, five times a week at night, or I want to find a positive way to deal with my stress. If you've gotten to the end of that month and you've found a positive way and you've binged less and, and you're feeling more positive about food, maybe you'll have only lost three pounds, but you'll feel a lot more positive about where you are. Right. So I think it's about kind of looking at it in a holistic way or, and trying to find the things that are going to make the most impact r right now. Mm. Um, but it always kind of really needs to start with food and your behaviors. What is more important, diet or exercise? I think diet is, right? Mm. Um, food, we have to eat food every day, mm. right? Um, we don't have to exercise every day. I think they're both incredibly important. I think that um, you should do both. Mm of course. And the research will say that if we're active and not sedentary, we'll live l l longer, but food is something we, we don't, we can't really avoid. So I think it's just so powerful to get that right. Um, not only what you eat, but like kind of what works for you personally, and then how to navigate your life, right. Your social life, flying your holidays, right. Because that's a part of it as well. It's not just about what you eat when there's nothing in your way, right? Because that's pretty easy. We can all do a five day or a 10 day. It's about how do you then um, extrapolate those habits out and make it so that you can be like this and still achieve your goals and feel great and not kind of go out once and then be like, ah, I failed. And then it leads to three weeks of of eating badly and feeling, feeling horrible about yourself. But I certainly, um, realized how much more important food was than exercise when I had my, my kids. Cause I had to have a C section, right? So I couldn't, I couldn't exercise. And when I ate badly, I could feel it. Like I was just, 
everything was harder. Um, not only did I feel just frumpier, but you know, my mood, my ability to cope with my child, uh, my hormones, my sleep. And when I ate well, I felt good. And it's just those, just such small things like that. Like we, we won't always be able to exercise in the way that we want. And food is something that we've got to do every day, all day. So I think it's about nailing that first mm. I actually never really thought of it this way because you know you're right we don't need to exercise every single day but yeah. food we can't avoid not eating but yeah. the other thing that you said is the social aspect of yeah, it yeah, yeah. and I felt like when I had my best diet and I say diet not in a regime yeah the regime like the things habits, that I eat yeah. habit that mm -hmm. I eat day to day when that was good for me yeah I just got so, I got bombarded with criticism from other people. Yeah, it's and really I challenging. That, I found that very, very strange because first of all, what business is it of yours? What mm -hmm. I put into my body? And sure, you go to a restaurant and maybe you're a little bit picky and you say, I don't want this and I don't want you're that. You're picky or you're maybe just particular. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it's a bad thing, but. So the social aspect, I yeah. feel like that's really hard because yes, if you lock yourself in a room for a week, you Easy don't go peasy. anywhere. <laughs> it's it's fine, you can do that. But then yeah. how do you integrate that into your day-to-day -day life and yeah. you know being around other people? Yeah. Is that the biggest barrier, do you think, to maintaining? Um habit? yeah, so I think that and just knowing what to do every day. So, I mean, we did a program last year called the 28 day reset and people lost weight. They felt incredible. Their skin was great. Their gut was great. And the feedback was sensational. And then we checked in with a lot of them kind of six months afterwards. And I'd say more than I expected had stuck with it, which was great. Um, but there was still that kind of cohort who was like, no, I, I just don't, I just don't follow things now. And so we wanted to understand why. And the number one thing they said was they didn't know what they should eat every day. But then the number two thing they said was social. Um, so they felt like either there was pressure on them from their peers or they just felt that self-imposed, um, or they would be made fun of. I mean, I mean, we're yes. adults and people are making fun of how we eat. It's very mm -hmm. strange. But um, they, or they, they didn't know how to handle kind of those ebbs and flows. And they still had that mindset where this is bad. Therefore, I've been bad. Therefore, I'll just stop and start again on, on Monday. Um, instead of this was just what I did on Wednesday night. And the next day, I'll just be normal and healthy. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're, we're still kind of trained to be on off. And actually we're, we're always on, right? We're always on. Um, and it's about, okay, I enjoyed this. What can I do to counter that and just feel good the following day and not panic? And that's what people don't know, or that's what they said they didn't know yet. So and it was hard. Apart from allergies that people may have or certain things that don't agree with them, mm -hmm. is a good diet the same across all the individuals or is it completely specific to you because one of the things like how can you find out what works for you and what doesn't work yeah for you? yeah yeah look it's it's a great thing to ask so there are some fundamental things that are for everybody right so a diet that's low in sugar you know avoiding your ultra processed foods that's un that that that's something that everyone uh, must try to do right and that will be healthier for everyone after that look there's so many different ways you can eat and the art is finding which which application works best for you um you know we all should eat fiber we all should eat lots of vegetables and then the everything else is pretty nuanced you know you can be a super healthy vegan you can be a super healthy meat meat eater but it's about you know what types of food are you eating what's the quality and what else are you eating with it so mm. um one of the best ways to find out and again i think this is why the 28 day program was so successful is to do an elimination right as you said when you strip it all back and you eat very simple things that your body is unlikely to react with, you you all of a sudden can tune in and there's no better feedback than what your body tells you, right? So I could even get a test and my test says I have an allergy to casein and whey. It doesn't say I have an allergy to apples, but when I eat apples, I just don't feel well. And apples are healthy, right? Mm. So it's it's very personal. And, and, and I think that again is something because we're not taught that, we expect to kind of start a diet that everyone else has tried on a Monday. And then like by next week, we're, we're great. And there are, there, there's a lot of things you can do with 
following an elimination the diet, but then the most important part is actually the part right after. It's not what you eat for that period of 28 days or, or six weeks or however long you choose to, to follow it. It's how you then um, eat and observe afterwards. And that should never really stop, right? I still, when I eat things, if I feel poorly the next day, I'm like, what did I eat last night? And I see, is it something that I ate? Is it something new? Is it, and you kind of always need to have that, the curiosity, right? Because, um, we're individual. So, mm -hmm. and, and some of it will be learning how you respond actually, if you haven't slept at all, we all know that when you don't sleep, you know, our appetites are wild. So actually what are the things we can try that day? So one day we should try to eat these said things when we know we haven't slept, see how that went. Did it go badly or did it go well? Right. So mm -hmm. we're not really taught that because we're afraid of the fluctuations, right? We want to be kind of good and then on and then thin. It's an know? element of control, isn't it? Yeah, of course. It's like uh, we but, want to uh, know yeah. that whatever you're doing mm -hmm. is working 100% of the time. Yeah, but finding out what works for you will work. So it's about switching your mindset like that. And I think it's really important to take your time to, to do that. It takes years, you know, it's not going to take three weeks. It's going to take an initial kind of effort and, and, um, and a commitment to saying, okay, this is what I've got to do because it'll make me feel much better. And I want to feel like I know what works for my body. And then it takes months of, of trial and error. Um, and so I think it's just about finding that headspace. So you're taking years. So how long will it take to find out exactly what works for you and what doesn't? And then how long do you need to, well, I suppose that's forever after that. Yeah, look, the great thing about the body is it's so responsive. Um, it doesn't take long uh, to find out, like to A, feel much better than what you have felt like. Um, and then to see what foods work, right? So when we did the 28 day, we say, okay, the next two weeks after that, you try one, one new thing every three days, right? So you bring your, your allergens back in and you just watch and wait. Right. And so I think you, you can find out those larger things quite fast. Then the nuance part is, okay, well, actually maybe you had the gluten once and you were fine. And, but then you need to kind of find your tolerance and that, that, that's the type of stuff that just takes, takes months. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of like, I know that I, when I eat it, I'm fine if I have it once. If it then starts to creep into every day, all of a sudden I'm bloated, I don't concentrate as well, my bowel doesn't feel as good, my skin doesn't look as good. And when we're not looking for something, we don't see it, right? So then if you weren't really trying to figure out what works, you, you might just think, you know, you're getting older or you're stressed or, but actually it could be that, right? So the big ones you can find out quite fast. And then the nuanced stuff, that's the stuff that just takes some time. Mm. Um, and, and then even on top of that, there's how your body responds to different spikes in your blood sugar, right? So there's so many people who, who ask me if they can eat fruit. And my answer is always yes, of course, but there are certain fruits that you're going to feel like you've just had a candy bar on and there's certain fruits that you're going to feel fantastic on and that you can tolerate well. Right. So it's about learning to see what are the signs. If you eat your breakfast and two hours later, you feel terrible. What you ate for breakfast doesn't suit you. There's something in it, in the combination or the quality of food or, 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 or what it was. And it's about learning to look for those types of things. Mm. Sorry, that was a really long answer. No, <laughs> not at all. Because I'm just thinking, what I ate last night because I was thinking, oh, I feel not feeling so great. Food hangovers are a thing, right? And it is. Yeah. And I, I found out through the process of elimination that dairy was just did not suit me. Yeah. And for a while I thought, well, maybe it's just, you know, everyone says, oh, you know, being yeah, lactose yeah, yeah. intolerant. And then I had a DNA test, which said I'm likely to be lactose intolerant. Okay. And I was like, you know what, let's just, you know, continue and see. And every time I have, you know, very high lactose, yeah. something like yogurt, for example, for me is just terrible. Yeah. It's just, it just does not work at all. Yeah. I had that in a dish yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then what I realized that all the cheeses that I like, 
tend to be either low in lactose or lactose free completely. Interesting. And that was really interesting. Because like your body's telling you. Yeah. yeah. And the same thing with coffee. Mm. I also stopped drinking coffee and caffeine during that period of time. And again, on my DNA test, because I never had an allergy test or anything like that. It just yeah. came from that. So again, I'm highly sensitive to caffeine. Yes. And I just naturally stopped. Yes. And for a long time, I was like, why am I drink when I'm drinking it? I just feel like very... Edgy, anxious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So like your body is very sensitive. If you listen, I think just being mm. proactive, not proactive, what's the word I'm looking for? Conscious of what you're... Yeah, it's both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what... Well, so one one time of my life that was actually really interesting for, for me was after I gave birth to Maisie, who's my first, um, I felt pretty terrible. So I was going through something bad with work and it was the pandemic and I, it was just, it was just, it was, it was a lot. Um, and I, she had terrible reflux. And um, so I cut out eggs and soy. I already don't eat wheat or dairy. Um, but when I spoke to the pediatrician, they said, I, I should cut out those things. And as soon as I cut them out, she was fine. So that, that was great. I love eggs. They're one of my favorite foods. So once I stopped breastfeeding, I brought eggs back in. And the first time I had eggs, I had a raging headache. Wow. So I was like, oh, why do I have a headache? Like, certainly it's not the eggs because I've eaten eggs my whole life. But actually, I've had headaches my whole life. And um, I separated my, my shoulder when I was 18. And my doctor said, well, that's what your headaches are from because you, you probably have some kind of nerve involvement. But then when I sat and thought about it, I was like, wait a second, I haven't had headaches since I cut out eggs. Um, and eggs didn't show up on my on my test. So, um, And then I tried again and I got a headache. And then I tried again. I because I was like, I can't give up like, eggs. <laughs> and I tried again and again. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's eggs. I, I Eggs give me a headache. And so, uh, and there were a few things l like that, that I kind of found out um, after I had her. And it's wild, right? Like your body will feed back. Mm. Um, you just need to be taught kind of what the signs are, right? Because so many of us still think food gastric stuff right so if i eat something bad my stomach will hurt or i'll have something wrong with my bowel but it's not it's concentration it's mood it's energy it's sleep uh it's skin it is bowel too but it's it's many different things it's not just that and so um that's one of the most interesting things right is to work all that stuff out does it make me sad i can't eat eggs 100 percent um do i still have them sometimes yep <laughs> not but not often because and i go through what most people do, right? Then I'm good for six months. And I'm like, I'm not having eggs because you know, I'm self-care. And then we went away to this hotel and the eggs looked amazing. And I was like, maybe I can have eggs on holiday. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's ridiculous. No, of I course you, you know, When you know what the consequences are, then you can make that decision. Yeah. And look, sometimes the consequences are small, right? Mm -hmm. So if I had a small headache and I was home alone, I probably have them more often. But to have a raging headache when you've got a toddler and a business and now a newborn for me, I'm just like, I don't care. It's not worth it. Mm. Like, I don't like eggs that much. Mm. Um, so it's, it, it's just one of those things you need to make a decision on. It's the same with me for alcohol. I had pneumonia, um, eight years ago now. And since then I just haven't been able to tolerate it as well. So I can still have it, but I can't have champagne, which I used to love. Um, and I just get a bit more sensitive. So I get a headache and a hangover a lot faster now. Since I had my baby though, I mean, the effect it has on my mood is just horrendous. And so I don't drink that often now. And people give me a hard time about it. They're like, Oh, you're perfect. Cause you're a nutritionist. I and I'm like, no, 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 I'm unhinged when, when I drink, like, I feel like I'm going to have a panic attack. It's not about me thinking that I shouldn't ha have alcohol. Mm -hmm. Um, and you just need to make a decision. Right. And I don't care that people make fun of me n now because I just think it's kind of lame. Um, and I'm like, look, I, I feel terrible. I wouldn't, you wouldn't make fun of me if I was like, I don't have mayonnaise because it makes me feel sick. They would be, be like, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Mm. But there's this, there's this thing w with alcohol and with certain foods. Um, Why is that? I don't I mean, know. I, I don't know. I experienced the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I stopped drinking for whatever reasons, just because it wasn't making me feel good at yeah. one point. And then I just sort of sometimes go through these phases where I just don't want to. Yeah. And the social kind of almost shaming yeah, yeah. for not it's drinking, wild. I find that that's just so 
strange. I feel like, I mean, living in London, you probably don't get as much of that because, you know, people are more aware. But even though... Well, I'm from Canada, so I actually get way more of it here than, than I do at home. Oh, really? Yeah. If you're at home and you don't have a drink, nobody even bats an eye. Like, mm -hmm. they'll offer you one. And mm -hmm. if you say no, they're like, okay, some water? Or, you know, so this is a UK thing then. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot more alcohol embedded into the culture here. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that pub culture. That there's a, and um, But... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. But there is a big thing with food and with alcohol where so many people I speak to, it's one of the biggest um, reasons why they find it hard to be healthy is because they get they get kind of ostracized for, for, for trying. Do you think that also because we live such hectic lives, we're so busy yeah. that we don't even have time to really, you know, go inside our bodies. So this body, the idea of body awareness is uh. almost like, oh, I'll deal with it tomorrow, or it just doesn't even come up on the agenda. Yeah. Are we not doing that because we're just so busy? Well, I think we're busy, but also, again, it's not something we're ever really taught. So mm -hmm. unless you start going to yoga and they talk about it, I mean, we don't learn it in, in school, and then you're kind of off into hectic life. So I think there are certain things that are so fundamental to our well-being that we should be taught in school, and yet we just have to learn them. And unfortunately, most of us learn them when we're going through something hard, right? So we learn them to help fix a problem, not to just be well. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're not taught at all. Like I eat this and it makes me feel like this. My husband and I, we kind of, we kind of, we laugh because he's from that kind of household. It, whereas when you're sick, you can eat whatever you want. So you get cakes and you get, you, you get candies. And the first time he, he, he was sick, I was like, I made you a broth and here's some, some tea. And he's like, Oh, I'm just going to have some chips and cake. And I was like, no, no, your body can't heal on that. And he was like, what? And I think for a second there, he was like, I'm not sure I can marry her, but, no. um, but it's, we are, we're taught that kind of a treat is comforting and we can escape and all that stuff. But actually when we're going through really hard things, there's no better thing we can do than to take care of ourselves and everything will feel easier and we'll bounce back faster. It's not always possible or it's not always easy. Um, but it's, it's what your body will respond to best. Mm -hmm. And so even circling back to the alcohol point, I'm, I'm personally now not somebody who drinks if I feel bad already. So if I'm really stressed, I won't ha have a drink. I prefer to feel really happy and then have one. So on holiday or because I know my body now and I know how I respond and how I respond is the following day I'm in pieces. I'm like way more anxious. I'm teary and it's not worth it. Um, so I still want it sometimes. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there are times where, we're, where I'm like, oh, I'd love a gin and tonic, but I, then I'm like, oh, no, I don't really want to feel terrible. And then you just need to work out what works best. And, and that's what I mean by it takes time, right? So mm -hmm. it takes time to come to that place where you feel totally comfortable and happy with those types of calls. And like, that doesn't feel like a punishment. I think a lot of the time well, through conversations with friends in particular, yeah, where, the relationship with the food or whatever you're consuming is such that it is the comfort. And if you totally. take that away from me, then you feel all the then feelings. it is the punishment. Yes. So when you are dieting, that association is yeah. with punishing yourself. Yeah. Um, and it's almost being driven by, you know, shaming yourself or yeah. for saying you're not worthy because yeah. you're, you weigh a certain amount. Like, or... How can you break that pattern? So, Again, I think this is why I love doing an elimination because if you can take this time and you're saying, I, I'm doing this to find out what works, not to lose weight. I mean, you will lose weight as a by, by product, so that's nice. But what I really want to do is work out what works best for my body, right? And you follow this plan. What usually happens by the end of it is you feel great, right? There were very few, few people who got to the end and were, were like, I don't feel very, very good, you know, like hands down, most people feel fantastic. Then as you add things in, you've raised your baseline. So you feel the fluctuations more. If you're somebody who always has headaches and always has, has problems with their sinuses, you don't notice if you're headachy and sinusy the following day, right? If you're feeling great, you notice it. And so I think you need to reframe this food makes me feel bad. Um, and that's very different than saying, I can't have it because I'm 
because I'm heavy, right? And so saying like, I don't want to eat this because I know it makes me feel terrible is empowering. Whereas saying, well, I, I, I can't have this because my nutritionist said I couldn't is not not very, very positive. So mm -hmm. I think it's all about the way you frame it in your head and like understanding that food is not just weight, food is energy, food is mood, food is sex drive, food mm -hmm. is everything. It's your patience, it's, you know, your attitude, it's everything. And so you need to just break the link if it's just tied to weight. And then from there on, you then, I think we need to be a little bit more um, patient with ourselves, right? Because again, I can't have this. And so this whole diet is, is horrible. Okay. Well, what can you have instead? Right? So it's about, I, I love food. I bake every weekend. I still like, I still have treats, but I just bake things. I know that my body can, can process and they still taste great. And my husband, who's a sugar addict loves them. So like, I can guarantee you, I mean, that that's been a process. I can guarantee you that there are things that are going to be better for you and even good for for you that you can eat that aren't going to make you f feel bad. So I think it's about understanding that as a process. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and again, that it just takes time. With regards to having a partner yes. that likes <laughs> to eat different things, because that very happened, common, that happened to me. Yes. <laughs> My diet. I mean, was, yes, I look <laughs> sitting over there <laughs> and, and kids as well. Yeah. So, you know, you go through phases of your life, you're eating extremely well, you're feeling amazing. And then there is an illness or you're with somebody who has a completely different style to you. Like, how do you kind of balance that when your partner, for example, has a completely different diet to you? It's tough. It's yeah. really tough. So Thankfully, in my case, um, my partner it was also was just very interested in health. So he's very active and he used to have, you know, tonsillitis like every other month and a lot of sinus problems and, you know, um, was carrying quite a bit of extra weight. So I was like, why don't you just why don't you try this and see how you feel? Right. Um, and he was on antibiotics a lot. And so he tried kind of a stripped back version of an elimination because I could get him to do th the whole thing. It was impossible. And the transformation he felt was was enough for him to lean into a healthier way way to eat. Now, he still eats his stuff. I, I can't control that. But at home, thankfully, he loves the way that we eat and he's on board with that. So, I mean, it's I think it it's all about finding ways to find the compromise where you can still cook and enjoy in incredible food that is healthy. Because I think, again, people are fearful that if they go on a diet, they're not going to enjoy their food and we need to enjoy our food. It's life. We have to. So someone's got to learn how to cook or you got to find somewhere where you can buy food that is both healthy and very, <laughs> very tasty. And I think mm. that's really one of the key things in regards to kids. I mean, I think that's really hard. Um, my daughter is two. So, so far she hasn't had anything really kind of bad, but she's going to nursery in the fall. And I, I know she will be exposed and I can't control that. So I don't want her to be, be ostracized and that kid who can't have anything, but you want to try to teach them what good nut nut nutrition is. So, I mean, it's going to be a balance between making sure at home we were like learning about really good food and how it makes us feel and that it's, it's kind of healthier and not having that kind of, this is bad. This is good. Cause you don't want to create kids who have issues with food, of course. So, I mean, I'll let you know how it goes, but it's, <laughs> it's hard. Right. Mm -hmm. But the thing I would say is when they're young and you're still kind of in control of how they can eat what they eat and what they do until they're three years of age has been shown to be incredibly impactful to their, their whole health as they age. Mm -hmm. Right. So trying to make sure that what you give them is as healthful as possible until then is, is important. My, my, my daughter, when she has a mango, I mean, you'd think you gave her a gold bar. She's like, oh, it tastes <laughs> it because kids are pure. Right. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't see the, I don't see a need to give her a processed cake because because why would I, right? The food she eats, she loves it and it's great. So will it happen? Yes. I'm sure it's going to happen within the next six weeks, but right now I've tried to be quite, um, on top of what she eats. Mm. And what about, do you see any differences between men and women 
in what respect? in terms of what diet works and what doesn't um or yeah more or less the same i mean i need no, yeah. no women um look we have hormones right so it, we are not going to respond in the same way men generally have a higher tolerance for fasting um so i hear a lot of people say that they started kind of in to to if with their partner and their partner lost um, 10 pounds in one month and they lost 1.5. And so there's a lot of frustration often, but men usually have more m m metabolically active muscle and they don't have estrogen, which is a fat storage hormone. So I think that, um, women need to be a bit more mindful about their own, um, biochemistry, um, in terms of, Mindset, though, I, I also see when you the men who I used to see in in clinic would be like, OK, and they would just kind of follow it. And the women would be a bit more emotionally attached. Right. So they would have much more of a I ate a cookie, therefore I failed. And they would get a lot more emotional if they thought they weren't being perfect. Whereas men would come back and say, yeah, I had a cookie one day, but apart from that, it was great. And I think there's a lot more kind of guilt and shame um, baked in to us as females. Mm -hmm. Talking about hormones. Yes. One of the things that I started implementing, and we, again, we talked about yeah. this, is paying more attention to my menstrual cycle. Yeah, of course. And the fluctuations in the mood, because I've yeah. realized that there are certain moments in my cycle where I'm just not good for anything. And then there are other points in my cycle where, you know, I'm much more verbally fluent. Yes. You know, I feel like more outgoing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the conversation we were meant to have was it like last week was like super, super hot. And I'm glad that also didn't happen. Because it was because, week four. <laughs> because it was, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh my God, how am I going to speak to you? Or, yeah. You know, my oh, question is just not going to come. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wish I had discovered that yes. much earlier. Yeah. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Cycle syncing is a big thing. And that's because it's it's real. Like our hormonal landscape changes every week, almost every day. Right. So we can't expect to do the same things and eat the same things and feel the same. And so I think understanding how the, those fluctuations in our hormones and our underlying biochemistry affect us is so important because I hear a lot of people say, yeah, I started my diet and I was so great. And then, and then all of a sudden I was just terrible and this, and, and like, when you link it to your menstrual menstrual cycle, it's usually actually, well, week one and two, it's pretty easy to follow pretty much anything. Week three gets a bit harder and week four is really hard. So what usually would happen is women who would speak with me is as they start to feel more on the PMSE side, they start to try to restrict even more and then kind of fail, right? Because you're restricting a ton. Actually, your body needs more. You need more calories. You're low in serotonin. You're low in everything. And then they kind of fall off the wagon, as as you say, and then they'd eat, you know, a tub of ice cream and, and feel terrible. But actually, if you just allowed yourself to eat a little bit more carbs that week, a bit more more calories, you'd probably feel fine. So mm -hmm. it's about learning how to work with your body so that you can go with the ebbs and flows instead of work against it and always feel like you need to be, you know, the same version of yourself because because we, we aren't, right? I think there is something about allowing yourself things rather than just always resisting i mean i know you have to there is this you know the kind of the the meditation aspect of it you yeah know, being aware of your body but also not resisting life so much yeah because i feel like a lot of the pain comes from just like oh i'm not allowed this yeah so there's a lot this. of suffering and yeah it just creates a lot of suffering but what you're saying is sometimes that you just need to allow yourself to be that way yeah and then things will just normalize yeah I mean, when, when you look at the luteal phase, as you come to your period, the body needs around 200 more calories a day, right? It's not right. And yet we tend mm -hmm. to restrict more because we might feel swollen. Um, we're also the least um, tolerant to alcohol in week four out of any week. And yet that's when we would usually say like, oh, I'm just going to have a drink. So there are all these things that we just don't know are naturally happening. And and because we don't know that, we think that we are weak or we don't have willpower, but actually if you just maybe had a bowl of pasta that day, you, you really wanted it, that would probably stop you from then having t 
20 cookies and a tub of ice cream and then feeling terrible and like you failed. And so it's about being a little bit more moderate, but also kind and patient with your diet and also with your body, because we do need to listen to what it's saying. And, um, I really urge everyone to look into what's happening within your menstrual cycle because it's so interesting and it's so eye-opening when you learn about it i think there's just such a huge data gap in terms of massive what happens in female bodies in particular and how you have been trialing things not just on yourself but also with, with other people to see what works and i think that's just such incredibly important work yeah because our bodies do go through so much change during the cycle yeah and i think we don't give enough credit to what happens and we can't be doing the same thing we can't have the same diet as men really no we're not men exactly with regards to pregnancy yes and let's talk about the changes there you've mentioned that how you started eating changed and as a result of the c-section how did a pregnancy and birth how did that impact you so i was actually pretty shocked at the advice i was given by my midwives and consultants because it felt very much like as soon as you're pregnant they're like eat whatever you want, just enjoy yourself, you're pregnant. And actually, I don't think it's not a time to restrict, but but actually we definitely need to take more care of how we eat. Um, and and not only for the baby, but, but for us. I, I mean, as you know, it's such a challenging time, but afterwards is even harder. And if you don't take care of yourself when you're pregnant, that afterwards bit is going to be a lot harder. Um, and I think that's a, that's a big part of pregnancy that women or certainly I was underprepared for just how you feel after you give birth and how actually you still look pregnant, you still feel pregnant, you are so lacking in sleep, you don't know what you're doing, you feel like you're failing every day and you feel like your body is not your own. I mean, it's madness, right? Mm -hmm. And so if your blood sugar is wild and you're under nourished, you're not going to, that, that, that period won't be easier. So certainly in my first pregnancy, I was probably a little bit more, um, loose with what I ate. Um, I still ate well, but I felt it right. Like, and my cravings were mad. I hated vegetables. I mean, it was very strange. Yeah. It was very strange. Mm -hmm. My husband was like, Oh my God, I've never seen this before. Um, (laughs) what happened to you? No, I just, mm-hmm. I, I just wanted white carbs all the time. I, I, did too. I Yeah. I mean, most w- women I speak to in months one, one to three, like I would do like a rice cake with hummus and like salt and oil. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's all I can handle. Um, and in my second pregnancy though, I was actually a lot more strict with how I ate, but I felt incredible. Um, and since giving birth, I've been really on top of it and I feel great and I'm bouncing back faster and I'm sleeping less now. Um, because the first time my baby unfortunately was in the NICU, but then by the time she got back, she was on a bottle cause she couldn't, she couldn't take a breast after that. So I bottle fed her still my own milk, but she could sleep for longer cause I bottle fed her. Whereas this one, she cost her foods all night and my energy is way better and I just feel way more positive. And so I think that it's really down to the fact that I'm being super careful with my, my diet and my supplements. So I think that it's really important in those times, you know, in challenging times, like I said, the best thing we can do is take care of ourselves like as hard as possible. I'm just comparing this to my two pregnancies. Yeah. And then my first, I did a, Mine were completely the reverse of yours. Okay. So I was extre- I ate extremely well in the first pregnancy and I didn't really have much cravings. And I actually put on very, very little weight during yeah. that time. Gave birth, you know, very, you know, good recovery. And what happened then is that I got pregnant very soon afterwards. So yeah. Aria was six months when I got pregnant oh again. Oh my gosh. And then after that, because I was still breastfeeding. Oh, savage. I can't imagine. And I was just constantly tired. Yes. And so at that point, I was like, I just need carbs, like pasta, cakes, like anything to do with carbs. Like I just was, I was needing that. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't really think of like, well, you know, you have a baby eating for two. I never really had that. It was more like, well, I only need extra, these extra calories. I don't really necessarily can eat everything and anything. And I didn't really want to, but in the second one, that's when I was like, you know what? I'm just too tired. Forget it. And I haven't been able to recover since. Yeah. And it's true. It's like when you, when, when tough gets 
t- you know, when times get tough, it doesn't it doesn't get easier to lose weight afterwards or yeah. to feel better or to but fix. But what your you're mood saying about yeah. using, you know, being more, much more conscious about what you're yeah. eating is actually going to totally help, help you. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, so I had my six week check last week, which is mm. a strange check because they don't really do anything, um, and they said, okay, how are you eating? And I was like, yeah, I'm eating really well. And they're like, yeah, good. Make sure you've got a lot of, you know, snacks and some chips and some chocolates on hand for when you're tired. So you can just grab things when you're breast. So I was like, pardon me. And they're they're They were like, yeah, it's really important to just get those calories in. And I was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, can you imagine for someone who has no understanding or knowledge of nutrition, their doctors and midwives are telling them to just eat chocolate and crisps all day when they're breast. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine anything worse. Not that it's a problem if you do choose to eat those things sometimes, but it's not going to be better for you in the long run. And so I think there's just a lack, like you said, there's, there's a really big gap in the knowledge between kind of the care for the life stages and cycles of, of, women and that needs to be bridged because we're getting bad advice mm. um and it's making us feel worse right it definitely is and i think if if you're taking advice or if you're expecting to get decent advice from yeah. the powers that be or people that's supposed to take care of you yeah well what hope do you have when you feel like you have to educate yourself it's right? really challenging mm. yeah yeah so i'm feeling much better this time than i did last time and I'm, I'm healing faster and I have less pain because of it. So, I mean, I'm really, not that I, I wasn't already, of course, sold on nutrition because I run a nutrition business and I'm a nutritionist, but mm. there are these times where it just becomes like, oh yeah, this is why, this is why it's so important. Mm. Um, and pregnancy for me has been one of those, those um, times in my first pregnancy though. I mean, I also did a ton of high intensity cardio, of course, because I was at cycle. Um, and although that helped my mind at the time. I definitely don't think it helped my body. And I think I was starving because of it. And I think that, um, I just needed more food and I, and I, I craved more and it made me very tired and exhausted. Whereas this time, you know, I worked out still a ton in my pregnancy, but it was a lot lower intensity. And I think that really suited my body. And also when you're pregnant, you know, it's, it's already quite intense for your, Mm -hmm. for your body and then taking care of it a two year old. And so I just listened more this time. Um, and it, it really helped. I think this idea of, of listening is so key. Yeah. Like we just don't do that. That just takes time. Right. I mean, when you're 25, you just want to do what you want to do. The most intense workout, the most intense night out, everything is intense. Um, if someone told me when I was that age to meditate, I'd be like, Shut <laughs> up. and now I'm like, can I just, I just need to meditate. So, but look, life, life gets harder. Things are harder back then. You know, you could go to work hungover and be fine and then come home and sleep. But now I have to run a business and I've got a toddler and I've got a seven week old baby. I, I mean, it, things just change. So mm-hmm. that's that, that again is just a part of the point we can't expect to just do the same thing our whole lives. Like we have to change with what's changing in our lives. And I think that we get stuck in ways like, Oh, I, I used to be able to eat like this. You're like, well, I also used to get 10 hours of sleep a night, you know, things, <laughs> things change. And mm-hmm. so we can flex things. And, and that's where we need to learn like what is actually moderate for us. And y- you know, earlier you asked the question, like, how, how can you be healthy without it feeling like a chore at some point you just need to decide, right? What's more important, the, the cookie or the bloating, right? And you might say the cookie and then fine, that's your choice, but stop complaining about it. Like if we get the knowledge of like, this food makes me feel bad. And then we're always eating that food. That's fine. It's your choice. But then it's like, okay, well, I choose to feel like this. I think it's I think it's difficult though because when I was eating very very well, yeah. I would notice bloating straight away. Yes. And I was like, I feel so uncomfortable. This yeah. So Cuz your normal is not bloated at all. But when I'm permanently bloated, you don't notice it. I don't notice it. Yeah. But worse than that, I eat foods that compound it because it's almost like there is something living inside me that's asking for it like your to maintain <laughs> like your microbiome. Well, yeah. yeah, because it feels like it's to yeah. maintain whatever the situation is. And I feel like a lot of people, even myself, even though I know what it feels like to feel great, 
after a while I forget. Yeah. And it's like, how yeah, can you just be reminded of how great it is to feel like that? So you know what pain actually feels like. I mean, if, that's where consistency comes in, right? So I think even though, so our health is something we're very on off with, right? But what if at the start of your year, you said, okay, every quarter I'm going to do like five days of, of this, whether it's, you know, low calorie and plant-based or it's a cleanse, or it's just really good food and meditation and taking care of yourself. So you, you just plan that in once a quarter if you plan in your year where you have time to take care of yourself, you know, to kind of, to, to top up, you don't get as far away. Right. And I think you just need to do things like that. Like if you are someone who's very social, who goes on a lot of holidays, you also have to plan in times to recover. Cause when you don't, then you just get to the, that time where you, you're like, oh, wait, I've gained two stone in five years and I feel terrible. And that, and that happens very fast. And you just need to plan it in the same way we plan in everything else. Because um, if we invest in our health, we get a lot back. And if we don't, then then we don't. And, mm. and you just need to practice it. Mm. It's like exercise. You need to practice. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, yeah. consistency for me is the number one word that just keeps coming up all the time. Yeah, it's not sexy. There's not, there's no magic pill. It's just, you gotta do it all. You just gotta do it all the time. You gotta do it. <laughs> you gotta do it all the time. Yeah. But like, think about our kids, right? And I think health becomes a lot easier to understand when we have kids. My daughter, when she's in a structured routine, she's amazing. She thrives. She's very little tantrums. You know, it's pretty easy. The moment you start to play with the routine, you're like, oh my God, this child's a monster. Um, but it's not their fault, right? Because everything affects you. You know, how you sleep, how you eat, the type of food. And we're, we, we, that doesn't change as we age. We just become smarter and think that we're smarter than that, right? We're, and, and I think that creating a structure where you have pillars that make you feel good. So it doesn't mean you have to be perfect on them all the time, but they are some foundational things in your life that you always do or you always plan in and that's how you feel good. You just need to kind of get to that place. It's almost like I'm going to do these things. I know what, how they're going to affect me, but then I have a contingency plan to counteract the effects of, of what I have been doing, but giving yeah. yourself that room rather than just, just jumping onto the next thing. And I feel like that's the same for a lot of things in life where you know, you, you, you get really excited about something, you start it, you're kind of in the middle of it, and then you sort of, you know, kind of, it filters out rather than just making a stop and having like an end to it. Yeah. It's almost like planning like an end. I don't know if I'm making any sense by no, saying like, that. I know what you mean, right? Because, <laughs> mm. so if I go out on a Saturday, thinking back to before I, because I, I haven't been out for fair long, <laughs> quite a long time because I have a seven <laughs> week old, but when I go out on a Saturday night, it, if I have alcohol and have food, fine. Then on a Monday, I'll probably do an IF and I'll just make sure that I'm really healthy kind of as, as my norm is. Um, so many people, they'll go out on a Saturday night then they'll feel bad on Sunday and they'll eat badly. Then they'll wake up on Monday with no plan being like, oh my God, I feel terrible. I'm bloated. And I, I had this many calories. And it, by the time they get to the point where they, they, they want to do something about it, it's like Wednesday. And then they go out again on like a Thursday. And so there's very few days where, whereas actually like if you just, you create kind of your fundamental, like this is how I eat. This is my, my norm. And when I'm social, if I do this, I know that this makes me feel good the following day. And you just need to kind of build those things in. So what, Arta? Great. <laughs> <laughs> what is your mission with it? Um, so look, at Arta, we just want to help people to create optimal health so that they can live kind of in their best life now and always. So it really stems from what happened to me as a child and the fact that I was so unwell and just through food, I, I transformed my life, food and targeted supplements and like learning about how my, 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 my body works. And so we really want to, to bring that to other people. So we've got our um, our targeted supplements, we've got our functional nut nutrition programs, and then we also want to add the knowledge part and we do that through seminars and education. So fantastic. Yeah. I'm actually really interested in some of your programs because Great. I think do one. Yeah, definitely. Because <laughs> I feel like I've 
sort of struggled by myself figuring things out. Yeah. Which, you know, which is fine because, you know, most people a, do. Most people do. And, you know, you do learn a lot by when you're very, very motivated. But what will be very helpful is to have more of a, a structured, more science backed yeah. process yeah. to follow. Yeah. And I think this is the same thing for a lot of people, not just to do with health, but, you know, having someone who is external with almost like a coach, right? Of to course. be able to give you the shortcuts and the insights that you it will take you ages to find that so totally yeah um, one of the questions that i had i mean obviously health affects everything but how <laughs> do you think health impacts leadership oh that's a great question so when you think of it kind of how our state of health will um, d- determine how we feel and how we feel will d- determine our attitude, how we interact with others, our level of patience, our, our, our few, so whether or not we get angry, whether or not we get anxious. So I think taking care of yourself is fundamental to being a good leader. I think also the discipline in taking care of yourself, because it does take that is a really good, um, foundation to then spill into your work, because as you know, to make something a success, you just need to be consistent and and disciplined for a long time. Um, so I think that it's, it's very challenging to either be successful or be successful and then enjoy that success unless you're healthy. I see a ton of people who are very successful and they're burnt out and they're overweight and they feel terrible and they've had a heart attack and they're on five medications. So it's like, well, great. So you've worked your whole life. You've missed a ton of stuff and actually you feel terrible. And so it's about balancing, um, being successful, but then also being able to enjoy your success and with how you live your life. Mm. I think one of the things I talk about in terms of key points to leadership is self-awareness. Of course. And being aware of what works for you, what doesn't. Noticing things. Noticing, noticing things Noticing things, about things about in others. Yeah. Well, that's it because if you can't notice things about yourself, you can't see that in other people. So mm. until you really have that self-awareness, I don't think you are able to appreciate how the others feel and in order to lead you need to be able to do that totally and so it really always starts with you and i think health is the main foundation if you don't have that foundation you don't have anything yeah i mean it's the same thing with parenting right if you're hungover and feel terrible what type of patience are you going to have with with your kid no but as you know Mm -hmm. it's the same with your team though if Mm -hmm. you're hungover and feeling terrible and feeling self-conscious and feeling snappy that will that will um, permeate through your team and energy is infectious, whether it's positive or n- negative. And so I think it's really about understanding your own energy and helping to create that positive environment with others. And cause you want your brand or your business to be successful, but you also want everyone in your business to be successful. So it can't just be about the outcome of your business. It's gotta be about the, the, the collective outcome. Mm. One of the things that I learned from my kids is yeah. that it doesn't matter what you say it's what you do <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes and it's the to, same for leadership a hundred percent a hundred percent yeah it's like your behavior is everything yeah. like how you show up how you turn up yeah it's you know it's it gets absorbed by others my my husband um he's from new zealand and so he <laughs> He walks a lot of places without shoes. It's very strange. So my, my daughter, yeah. So my daughter, um, you know, she's young yeah. and I don't want her to step on some glass. So mm-hmm. I'm always like, put your shoes on. And she, she says, no shoes, daddy. And she'll point at him. And I'm like, Richard, put your shoes on now. <laughs> and he's like, ah. Oh. And then he tries to tell her and she's like, no shoes to daddy. And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, shoes on. <laughs> but it, I mean, those, those such small things, but there's, there, it, it's such a real comparison to life right because Mm -hmm. maybe your team member won't say well you did this but they'll think it and they'll they'll record it and they'll know it and Mm -hmm. if you keep doing that you know you kind of lose the integrity of your word right you know you say one thing but you always do something else and that's where leadership often gets fractured i think Mm -hmm. what prompted you to start arta i mean like i've said just uh, my my view on health so i think just my personal experience then in in clinical practice i found that i didn't have a supplement brand that i loved that i thought was really efficacious that worked that was the potency that i wanted that was the quality that i wanted and i found that so many people wanted supplements and needed them but i just didn't know what 
to say because I didn't have a brand that I loved. Pause that. I then went to cycle. Um, and although people were getting really fit, they weren't necessarily getting healthier. So all these people who were loving movement and kind of quote unquote healthy still had IBS, still had eczema, still had acne, insomnia, gut problems. I mean, you name it. We all kind of walk around with something, right? Mm -hmm. Chronic headaches, problems with hormones. And that's because still there is a disconnect. You know, we can exercise, but then eat all these things. And there's still not a lot of people who are trying to really teach you how to eat um, with good nutrition plans, sorry, and uh, good supplements. And so I really thought that I wanted to bridge that gap because I know that it's needed. I know that we're not learning these things from the doctors yet. Um, you know, there's such a gap between what we know now and then how it filters down into clinical practice that functional medicine has incredible outcomes, but it's, it's, um, very hard to access because it's expensive, right? To see someone one-on-one, you're looking at 300 pounds for one, and then you need to learn all the stuff afterwards. So it's quite an investment. Whereas if you make the, the, the programs that are accessible to all, you're kind of sharing your knowledge in that way. And then as we combine them with the supplements, I just really want people to get those really great outcomes so they can feel right. They can feel, Oh, this is what my gut feels like when I eat well, and this is my energy and here's my mood. And so to really understand the connection between what we do and how we feel. Mm. What's the hardest thing about running a business? Um, I think the hardest thing is always fund for fundraising, isn't it? I mean, people, I think expect me to say that the day to day stuff, but the hardest stuff is getting people to give you their hard earned money to support your vision. So I think that's always hard. And then, um, staying focused on what is actually going to move the needle is also very hard for small brands because you kind of, there's so many opportunities that you have to do, do partnerships and spend time on stuff, but actually, is it going to help where you've got to be to then get more money? And so it's about, really trying to align the vision with how you could communicate yourself outwardly to what your internal results are so that you can get more to, to, to be more and to really fulfill your vision, I think is really challenging. Mm. And then of course it's it's hard to find a good team. Yeah. Team managing people is always hard, right? Cause we're all individual. Um, so what advice would you give your younger self? Just things take time patience this is honestly things take so much longer than you'd like i think um so if you can just be a bit calm in that and patient i think it would save a lot of the suffering that we said from from earlier about like why don't i feel good yet why haven't i done this yet why haven't i like i find myself sometimes at night looking at brands being like oh they're doing this so well this brand has been in business for 15 years i've been in business for eight months right so you're like (laughs) why am i comparing myself to a brand that's been in business for 15 years and it has has had 20 million of capital when we've done a friends and family round and we've done this and so So again, it's about time and managing your expectations. And my friend um, once told me you can't eat an elephant in one sitting. And I think that's a great expression for everything, for a business, for parenting, for breakups, because it just reminds you that like big things take, take time. They do. Yeah. They really really take time. But I think this idea of comparing yourself to others Ah. is so innate to us as human beings. Yeah, of course. That's partly what gives us the strength to you know, to, to move beyond our current situation as well. It can be very but positive. It, yeah. But, but you got to balance it. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. So that's it probably. What, what seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it will change sleep. the course of your no. life. <laughs> <laughs> Getting 12 hours of sleep. No, sorry. Finish that the seems question. very impossible yeah, yeah. to me right yeah, now. I know, too. Right? <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. What was the rest of the question? What seems, what impossible? seems impossible to you now, but yes. should you achieve it will change the course of your life or your business. Oh gosh. That's a big question. Oh, look, we're, we're, we're new, right? I remember at cycle when we had been in operation for six months, we were, um, you know, struggling to fill 
10 classes a week. You know, we, we had 600 people coming through the door every week and it seemed impossible. It seemed like, how are we ever going to make this a success? Fast forward to before I left, we were seeing over 10,000 people per week. So I think, again, it's just right now we're a small brand and we're doing well. The customers l really love the results and our return rate is huge. It's fantastic. I'm super proud of it. But you know, we, we just need to move more. So just the volume, right? So it's the same as I remember looking at the numbers going up a cycle, being like, okay, okay, once we get here, then we'll have money to do next site and this and that. So I think it's just about those milestones that really help you open the doors to the next phase in your business that, you know, will just make it a bigger thing. I know that's a bit on the general side, but I think it's just, mm. I think that's it. Mm. What's the future for Arta? What What's the bigger, bigger picture for you? Yeah, like we, I'm really into community health and trying to make an impact. So I know that we want to spend more time with that. And I think first we need to get to the critical mass where enough people kind of know who we are and they're getting the great results from our programs, but also then helping to change how things are now would be the ideal for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thank you so much. <laughs> thank I you for talk, having me. I mean, I have so many more questions for you yeah. with regards to health and... We can do that part two. Yes, we should. Yeah. But such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for hosting me. Thank, thank you so much. You. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.